Good morning. Didn't know where to sit, did you? <laughs> well, we're going to continue in Hebrews, the series that we're in, titled A Satisfied Soul. Today we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 6. The writer of Hebrews up to this point has been challenging the readers of this letter to be diligent and to be determined to mature spiritually. He's writing to Christians who were being tempted to go back to Judaism or to give up altogether. They understood the law and the rules that they had lived by for so many generations, but now this concept of grace was foreign to them. In essence, he's saying it's decision time. It's decision time. Are you planted firmly in Christ or not? Are you going to waver back and forth? Are you going to just drift back to the old way of living? Or are you going to grow up and mature into spiritual adults? If not now, when? I thought about that this morning. I thought, you know, it's, it's decision time every day we get up. Every day we get up, it's decision time. How am I going to live this week? Who am I going to live for this week? Chapter 6 begins with a word of challenge, and then it moves into a words of warning and words of encouragement and words of reassurance. First, the words of challenge found in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1. The writer says, therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death and a faith in God, instruction about cleansing rites and the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment, and God permitting, we will do so. That's what they were doing. They were drifting back into the old ways of thinking and the old things. They, they, he says, don't just drift aimlessly. Move on to spiritual maturity. And you know what spiritual maturity is? It's holiness. It's a life of holiness. That's how you can tell who the mature are. It's not the people that have been Christians the longest or have memorized the most Bible or, or done the most ministries. It's who lives a life of holiness. The Christian goal is to become like Jesus. Paul said that we need to learn from Jesus' example. He said, follow me as I follow Christ. The goal is maturity. The, the, the definition of maturity is holiness like Jesus lived. And we've seen that the only way to grow and mature is to devote yourself to one thing, passionately obeying Scripture. Another vital element to growth and maturity beyond the Bible is active involvement in the church. I, I honestly believe that. I believe that God made us and designed us to need one another. The Bible says, one part can't say to the other part, I have no need of you. Church is not something that is just something to do if nothing better is going on on Sunday morning or if you feel like doing it. That's an investment in your maturity. That's an investment in your growth spiritually. That's an investment to, uh, that you make into a life of holiness. And I don't mean just showing up. Today's, you know, volunteer appreciation. Look at the thing in your bulletin. How many people volunteer in different ministries here at this church? Almost everybody. That's part of the the flexing of spiritual muscles that make you stronger and more mature. Paul talked about both of these ingredients, involvement in a church and, and a commitment to Scripture when he wrote to the church at Ephesus. He talks about the local church. He says, as a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. What he's saying is none of us is as good as all of us. None of us is as good as all of us are when we work together. Nothing works Better than the local church when the local church is working the way the Bible designed it, the way God designed the local church. One part of the body helping another, doing what we're doing with the church in Texas, weeping with those who weep, and rejoicing with each other when we rejoice. God designed this unbelievable thing called the church for our benefit, and yet we take it so casual. I was praying this morning, I said, God, don't let this just be mundane and routine and normal and ordinary. Because when you've been doing it as long as I have, it easily becomes that. And you lose sight of the, of the brilliance of God in designing the church so the people like us could lock arms together and help one another. And then he talked about the Bible. In the same 
letter to the Ephesians. He says, Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of Him who is the head, that is, Christ. Right to the, uh, to the Ephesian church, Paul says, The Bible plus the church equals maturity. I've never met anybody that I would say is a a believer that I want to emulate, that I admire, that is an example to me. I've never seen a mature believer who wasn't committed to the Scripture and who was separated from a local church. I've never met one. And I've been a Christian going on 40 years. So that was the challenge. Devote yourself to the church. Devote yourself to the Bible. And then words of warning. Verse 4, he says, It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who've tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the power of the powers of the coming age, and who have fallen away to be brought back to repentance. To their loss, they're crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting Him to public disgrace. Land that drinks in the rain, often falling on it, and that produces a crop useful to those for whom it is farmed, receives the blessing of God. But land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and is in danger of being cursed. In the end, it will be burned. Does does that make sense to anybody? Does that passage make sense to anybody? Because to me, it's really confusing. As a matter of fact, this is one of the most difficult, confusing, and controversial portions of Scripture in the entire Bible. It deals with what theologians call eternal security. Can you lose your salvation? Can you be a Christian one day? And do things for so long that are so bad that you're no longer saved at some point in the future. This, is, this has caused a lot of problems. It has divided Christians. It has destroyed churches. It has caused confusion and doubt and fear and worry and uncertainty. Because there's people walking around feeling like, my gosh, I, I've lost my hope. I've lost salvation. I thought, you know what, this is a good place to linger for a minute and talk about how to read the Bible. I want to talk about how to read the Bible. If we're going to devote our lives to the Bible so that we don't drift back into the old way of living so that we can move on to maturity, we got to know how to read the Bible because the Bible is full of difficult passages and confusing verses and some things that just don't make sense. There's four principles to use whenever you're trying to understand difficult passages. I'm not talking about the easy ones, you know, for God so loved the world. Those are the easy ones. I'm talking about passages like this. First, allow the text in context to speak for itself. Don't try to read something into the Bible. Take it for the context that it's in. Who was it written to? Who was it written by? Why was it written? And what is it really saying? Not what you want it to say, but what's it really saying? That's the first principle you got to read it in context and allow the text itself to speak for itself. But sometimes that's not just possible. There's not enough information in that one text. So that's the second principle. Use the entire Bible. You've heard me say it before. Nobody is more dangerous than somebody with a verse. There's something that they want to do or believe or act like or blame or do. They point to a verse. It says right there. I can quote you verses that make no sense, that contradict the rest of the Bible. Don't use a single verse or a single passage when interpreting difficult passages. Use the entire Bible. And that leads to the third principle. Interpret the obscure by using the obvious. The Bible does not contradict itself. Difficult passages need to agree with clear biblical teaching elsewhere in the Bible. So if you read a difficult passage and it seems like, well, your salvation is dependent on you being a good person, you know you're interpreting that wrong because there's other places in the Bible that contradict that that are very clear and very plain and very simple. Difficult passages need to agree with clear biblical teaching elsewhere in the Bible. And the fourth principle in interpreting difficult passages, if you don't know, don't come to a conclusion. You don't have to have an opinion on everything. You know, I I remember when I was a brand new Christian in, in And I thought I had to have an opinion on everything. And here 40 years later, there's a lot of things I don't have an opinion on or that I've changed my opinion on over time. You know, somebody once said to me, 
are you pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-trib? And I said, no. And I, you'd have thought I fell from heaven. He looked at me in total confusion. Well, you've got to be one of the three. And I said, no, you don't. There's a fourth option. I don't know. Listen, doctrine must include a personal conviction. Don't believe something just because you've been fed it for so long. Don't believe something because somebody else made a good argument. If you don't have a personal conviction about it, it's okay. There's certain things that are absolutely essential to being a Christian. Those aren't the ones I'm talking about. I'm talking about the non-essential things. And if you do have a personal conviction, stand on that conviction. So what are these verses talking about? The portion that I just read. If a person tasted of the heavenly gift and and, and the Holy Spirit and falls away and it's impossible for them to repent and blah, blah, blah. There's two predominant views on this passage. One view is that it speaks of a Christian losing their salvation. Someone who repeatedly drifts in and out of the family of God. You know, that when, they're, when they're keeping step, they're a member in good standing, but when they blow it, that somehow they're now a stepchild. Or now they're not in the family at all. Someone who is saved when they obey and lost when they disobey. And that's so logical to a lot of people. That you have God's favor when you obey Him and you have God's disfavor when you disobey Him. And they believe that if sin isn't repented of, then the person is in danger of losing their salvation. But verse 6 speaks about people to whom it's impossible to repent. So the passage itself disproves this point of view. It can't be that you can lose your salvation if you repent and if you, don't, if you sin and then if you repent, you gain your salvation back because it says it's impossible for these people that it's talking about to repent. This is why we need to apply principle number two and number three when interpreting this passage. We need to use the entire Bible to understand the text and we need to use clear teaching to interpret unclear passages. Does that make sense? Am I saying that right? Jesus clearly taught that salvation is secure. That you can't lose your salvation. That salvation is eternally secure. He said in John, Very, very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. He didn't attach at the end of that statement when they're good, when they obey. He said, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. That's pretty clear. So we know the passage that's difficult doesn't say what it appears to be saying because it contradicts with clear teaching here in the book of John. Listen, our salvation had nothing to do with us. People say, They talk about accepting Jesus. When I became a Christian, I didn't accept Jesus. I begged Jesus to accept me. We don't pick and choose Jesus. He chose us. We had nothing to do with our salvation. We've been saved by grace that was given to us by God. We were saved by grace through faith that was given to us by God. We were saved by grace given to us by God through faith given to us by God in a Savior sent to us from God. What part of that did we have a part of? That's the whole definition of grace. We didn't get saved by repenting. Ephesians says, but because of His great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. Dead people can't repent. I always marvel at the people that say, well, you're not healed physically from your illness because you lack faith. Well, how much faith did Lazarus have? He was dead. He didn't have any faith. Faith didn't raise Lazarus, and repentance didn't save us. We played no part in our own salvation. Again, same church, Ephesians, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. So if we are saved by God, doesn't it stand to reason that we can be kept by God, secure in our salvation for all eternity? The writer of Romans says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, 
Neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And it mentions it there, look, when you, when you aren't walking the walk, when your life isn't aligned with Scripture, when you're not living in obedience to God, that doesn't affect your salvation. Because that doesn't separate us from God's love. Paul told the Philippians, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. He told Timothy, that is why I'm suffering as I am, yet this is no cause for shame because I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. What did he entrust to God? His soul, his hope of salvation, of eternal life. So it doesn't speak about people who drift in and out of the family of God who one moment are saved and the next moment aren't. And the other predominant understanding of this portion of Scripture is well, it's talking about people who never really were saved. People who just looked good or talked a good talk or, or, or appeared to be a Christian but in fact never really accepted Jesus. But the writer is writing to Christians before and after this portion of the letter. Remember, you've got to read it in context. The writer uses the terms we and us throughout this entire letter. Verse 1 of this chapter, Therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity. Who's the us? Believers. He's writing to Christians. The real difficulty in this passage is in verse 3. Actually, it is in three verses, beginning in verse 4. It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the coming age, who, and who have fallen away to be brought back to repentance. It's impossible. How can someone who was never saved fall away? If they were never saved, they couldn't fall away, could they? Unbelievers have never been enlightened. They've never tasted the heavenly gift. They've never shared in the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus is the gift. That's the gift that that this portion of Scripture is dealing with. John tells us Jesus answered the woman at the, the Samaritan woman at the well. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Paul said to the Corinthians, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Jesus is the gift, the heavenly gift. And non-Christians haven't received that gift yet. This passage is not speaking about salvation. It's speaking about Christians repenting. That's what it says in verse 6. And it's a warning that Christians can fall away to the point of being unable to repent. Impossible, as a matter of fact, to repent. When that happens, the believer doesn't lose his salvation. The Christian isn't destroyed, but his works are and his rewards are lost. That's what this passage of Scripture is talking about. And this is a concept clearly taught in other places in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians, by the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it's burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. Clear teaching that we are building a life that will be judged by the master builder one day when we stand before God, either on the great white throne judgment or when we die and go before him to be absent from the bodies and be present with the Lord. And the the materials we use to fashion and form and mold and build our life out of will be tested by God. And if if it doesn't live up to whatever standard he's going to use, and I'm not sure what that standard is, the rewards will be lost and the works will be burned up, but I will be saved. That's what this says. One verse, or verse one 
speaks of acts that lead to death. 1 John says, if you see a brother or sister commit a sin that does not lead to death, you should pray and God will give them life. I refer to those whose sins do not lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death. And I'm not saying that you should pray about that. All wrongdoing is sin, and there is a sin that does not lead to death. The concept there is there are certain acts that are different variations. People say, well, there's no no distinction in sin. Well, the fact that if you're guilty of one sin, you're guilty of all of the law, the Bible says, that's true. But I don't think a white lie is the same as murder. I think those have different consequences. And I think God judges them differently. And I think there are absolutely behaviors and lifestyles and sins that God judges and they die. And it's probably not the ones you're thinking of or that I'm thinking of. First Corinthians says, So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord, communion, in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup, for those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. So God's judgment comes in the form sometimes of sickness or disease or weakness and sometimes even death. But I believe that he's taking our physical life to save the soul for the eternal security that we enjoy. We can lose our reward, but we can't lose our salvation. The writer continues with a word of of encouragement and affirmation. He stops blasting now and he starts building. He moves from warning us to encouraging us Because we need both. We need warning sometimes. But we also need encouragement. You know, I want to issue a challenge. I usually do this at the beginning of a message or the end of the message. Right here, two-thirds into the message, I want to issue you a challenge. Find someone to encourage today. And then find somebody else to encourage sometime this week. Some people have the gift of discouragement. They walk in the room, they suck all the life right out of the room. Don't be that guy. Don't be that girl. Be that encourager. People need it bad, and there's so few people dishing out encouragement. So encourage somebody today, volunteer appreciation day is a perfect day for it, and find someone this week to encourage. And the writer goes on in Hebrews chapter 6, he says, Even though we speak like this, dear friends, we are convinced of better things in your case, the things that have to do with salvation. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. We want each of you to show the same diligence to the very end so that what you hope for may be fully realized. We do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. The writer encourages these weary followers of Jesus to continue on towards spiritual maturity. He hopes that the temptation to just drift or just kind of take life as it comes or to quit altogether will be overcome by the urge his passionate urge, encouraging them to move on toward maturity and spiritual health and vitality. And the writer mentions things that accompany salvation, good works and changed lives. Those aren't the things that bring salvation. Those are the things that salvation brings. Good works, all of a sudden, greedy people become generous and selfish people become selfless and uncaring people become caring. Those are the good works and changed lives that the gospel of God's grace produce. But they don't bring salvation. They're the response to God's salvation through grace. And he reminds his readers, God remembers your work. God remembers acts of obedience, acts of kindness, acts of grace toward others, acts that help his people, the church. Did Did you notice what he said? When he said, God's not unjust. He will remember your work and the love you have shown him by helping his people. When we help one another, we're showing our love for Jesus. He says, God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people 
and continue to help them. People think that the greatest act a Christian can do is to reach out to the lost or go to the mission field. You know, I think one of the greatest acts you can do as a Christian is to love other Christians because that's who God loves. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loves the church and gave himself up for her. The writer is reminding the faithful believers that their work in building God's kingdom does not go unnoticed. He said, others may forget, God will remember forever. Every act of kindness, every act of obedience, every extension of grace to another person, every act of kindness or mercy or forgiveness, God will remember forever. And then the writer concludes with the words of assurance because he doesn't want to frighten his listeners. He wants to encourage them, and he wants to reassure them. And he says, when God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. So after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. People swear by someone greater than themselves, and the oath confirms what is said and puts to an end all arguments. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear, to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner, Jesus, has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Again, he's talking about salvation. The hope of eternity in heaven, in our future. The assurance of our salvation because of Christ's work on the cross is a hope that anchors our soul because it's firm and it's secure. And he who promised is faithful. And he doesn't lie. And he keeps his promises to a thousand generations. Our whole life and future rest on God's grace and God's faithfulness, not our own. Not our own. We may fail to trust God, but God never fails to be trustworthy. We may disappoint God. God never disappoints us. He dis- we don't get what we want a lot, but God never is unfaithful. He never goes back on a promise. He never fails to fulfill a promise. God made a promise, and he swore an oath. And he did that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. We who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. Every Christian, everybody who has crossed that line of faith and whose salvation is secure and firm and will spend eternity in heaven with God one day, we all fled the same things. We all fled a life of darkness and hopelessness. We fled a life of sin. We fled an empty life and a meaningless way of living. That's what we fled. By God's grace, he drew us to himself. And we fled in order to take a hold of Jesus. He is that anchor. He's the anchor for our soul. Our hope or our confidence is an anchor for our soul during the storms of doubt and fear and uncertainty in life. When you don't know if you're going to make it or not, you've got to hold on to Jesus and let him anchor your soul. You can be confused intellectually, You can be confused by the circumstances. You can be disheartened by the circumstances. Let Jesus be the thing that anchors you in life because life is too complicated, too many hardships, too many disappointments, too many problems in life. The best way to keep from drifting is to hold on to the anchor of hope. Jesus is that hope. Hope in the day of salvation the day of living, the day of death, the day of judgment. He is, he is the hope in every one of those scenarios. The Bible makes it clear. If the band wants to come on up, I'm going to wrap this up. Mature people are holy people. Holy people are mature people. They're synonymous. Paul told Timothy, Do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us and called us to a holy life. Not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. Peter says this, You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. 
God's special possession so that you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. Mature people are holy people. The challenge we find in the first half of the book of Hebrews, don't drift from obeying the Bible. Don't fall away from being a fully devoted follower of Jesus. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Move on to spiritual maturity and live a life of holiness. That's the challenge. Let's pray. God, we so often want to complicate the simplicity of the gospel, the simplicity of a life lived by your grace, by the help you offer through the Holy Spirit. It's so easy to complicate that which is simple. And God, I pray that you would get us back to the simplicity, the simplicity of the gospel, the simplicity of our hope being secure and firm and true and sure in the future, not because of our lives, but because of your death because of the one who promised is faithful. I pray, God, that we would see maturity break out in our lives, the life of our church, the life of a people that we come in contact with, and let it begin with us. In Jesus' name, amen.